So today, I wanted to talk to you all about logos and the ways that we interact with and interpret them. So this image, as I'm sure you all can guess, is an apple. Maybe it's not an apple. It may be a bit too obscure and abstract. I'm just going to unabstract it a bit. And there we go. That's an apple, right? But if I'm being honest, I don't entirely believe that this is an apple. I mean, there's no form or dimensionality. And how often have you bitten into an apple that's rainbow striped? Because I'm going to assume never. Let me just make it a bit more representational, and there we go. That's definitely an apple, right? Undeniably and arguably an apple. But whenever we're talking about logos, the first image I showed you was too mysterious. It was intriguing and interesting, but it didn't give you a message to interact with. And the third image I gave you was too representational. It said what it was, but it didn't give you any space to want to discover any hidden meaning. It told you what it wanted, and that was all. But it, the middle image I showed you, an image I'm sure you all recognize, is the Apple logo. This logo in particular was designed by Rob Janoff in 1977. This icon has remained the representation of Apple for over 40 years, and the only thing that's changed since has been the color. What is compelling about this logo is that it balances clarity and mystery, representation and abstraction in a way that is compelling yet intriguing. In its abstraction, it gives you the space to discover hidden meanings, such as the bite taken out of it, reflecting the bite in technology. But it represents an apple in a way that is familiar and allows us to understand it and ground ourselves in that understanding. The role of a designer, the role of Rob Janoff and myself, is to balance clarity and mystery in a way to create images that are compelling to viewers, that invite them to interact with the design but also gives them space to understand it. So in my own personal work, uh, I created this logo um, for an Italian restaurant called Boco al Lupo. Um, it was a family-run local restaurant, and what they wanted was just a simple and unique um, logo for their company. Um, and I'm sure, as we all know, Italian restaurants are ubiquitous, and with them, ubiquitous logos that are far too common pasta, pizza, um, showing just a simple tomato is a really common approach to Italian restaurants, but I wanted to take a different approach, something a bit more simplistic, but underneath it imply hidden meanings. So I include an olive branch um, wrapped in a badge, and olives, as we all know, are a staple in Italian cuisine, olives and olive oil, um, but olives also represent much more. They represent peace and coming together and meeting, or, and meeting together. And the badge itself is more than just a badge. It's a table. And so what I wanted to imply in this, message, in this logo, although it is simply at face value, just uh, an olive branch wrapped up in a badge, it, I also wanted to portray the idea of meeting around a table and coming together in peace. The idea of dinner being more than just dinner, it's also a time that people gather, and I wanted to represent that in this logo. And in another logo, um, I worked for an on-campus branding agency, and we were approached by Brown Library to create um, a logo for them. They wanted to change their name from, Ace, from Brown Library to ACU Library. And so we approached this initially with a lot of pictorial logos, um, but they were always too on the nose. We had books and owls and the building itself. Um, but they seemed too easy and too unoriginal. Um, and I decided to take this approach in um, exploring the typography of ACU Library. Because they wanted to emphasize the, rename, the rebranding within the name, I thought I might as well explore the name itself. And so I messed around with ACU, exploring different ways to approach the type. And I ended up coming to this um, form in which the letter forms, all the curves match each other. And what I realized is whenever the A and the C are curved in the same way, they create these shoulders. And so then after that, it was just a natural assumption to stick a couple of heads on top of the shoulders and a speech bubble above the U. And what I wanted for this project was that it could be expanded into the speech bubble containing the different disciplines and the different educational opportunities offered in the library. So when we all go into a library, especially the ACU library, we know that it offers so much more than what we expect it to. We may go in wanting to rent out a book, but then we make a new friend. 
we may go in to study, but then we happen upon the Maker's Lab where we're able to explore our creativity. What I wanted to represent in this logo was that though it's easily read, you can pass by ACU Library and understand what it says immediately. I also wanted to give a little bit of mystery and invite people to discover something and feel like they're in on a secret, much like they are when they're in their familiar library. So before I move forward, I feel as though I should further explain what a logo is. Um, it can be misconstrued to represent any type of graphic design, but a logo specifically is essentially the face of a brand. Um, and what's interesting about a brand is that, and studies have shown this, when we interact with a brand and when we talk about a brand, we talk about it in the same way we would a person. We ascribe humanistic characteristics and qualities to it when we form relationships built on trust through transactions with the brand itself. And so what logos are for brands is a way for them to present themselves to people, whether they're interacting with the product itself or the logo on a Twitter avatar. The logo is what a brand uses to pour their values into. And so my father understood this idea of a brand in that whenever we relate to a brand, we want to be associated with the right people, right? And in the same way, we want to be associated with the right brand. So my dad told me a story a while back of when he was 13 in Minnesota, and I guess 13 everywhere else, but he... <laughs> Uh, his uh, mom, my grandmother, went back to school shopping for him. And at the time, Nike sneakers were all the rage, much like they are now. But she didn't go and buy him Nike sneakers. She ended up going to Target. They're in Minnesota, it's natural. And she got him a pair of sneakers that bore a logo very much similar to the Nike logo, but different enough that it made him the subject of a lot of mockery from his peers. It looked like the Nike logo, except it was a bit slimmer and a bit stretched out, and it was upside down. <laughs> so for those who were familiar with the Nike logo, this was a completely fraudulent logo. But for my grandmother, who's, uh, who, who recognized the logo just as much as she would recognize the celebrities who represent the brand, which is to say she didn't at all, it was just a naive mistake of misidentification. And what's interesting about the Nike logo is that we venerate it, the Nike swoosh, as this fantastic logo that carries so much power, but when the Nike logo was first created, it was nothing. In fact, when Nike approached um, an Oregon branding agency to create the logo for them, they hired their intern, Caroline, to present a logo to them. And what Nike wanted at the time was three stripes, like Adidas. But Adidas had the three stripes, so they couldn't do three stripes. And so Caroline presented them with this sort of chubby check mark, and they reluctantly took it. Um, in fact, they only offered Caroline $35 for this Nike logo. But what they ended up doing is they formatted an entire marketing scheme around the logo. They allowed the logo to be a vessel into which they poured their brand identity. And so they created an ad campaign where the Nike logo was associated with all the values that Nike has, such as championship and competition, athleticism. Later on, in case you're wondering, Caroline was reapproached by Nike and paid back with an undisclosed amount of Nike stock. <laughs> but this idea of message and image in which we associate a logo with the identity of a brand is actually demonstrated in a fine art painting. This piece by Rene Magritte called The Treachery of Images demonstrates this idea that a message and the image can exist in conflict. In this piece, we see what we understand to be a pipe, but underneath it is a statement that claims otherwise. It says, c'est non pas un pipe, or this is not a pipe. But it's interesting because when we see the image, of course we process pipe, what else are we supposed to think? But the statement is also true. This is not in a literal sense a pipe. And what is interesting about this is that while we can still claim that this is not a real pipe, it is simply an abstraction of a true pipe, it nonetheless triggers in our brain to see it as a pipe. And this idea that we ascribe value into an image is demonstrated all throughout graphic design. What's interesting about graphic design and art as a whole is that it's a conversational language. And design, moreover, is a colloquial language, which is to say it concerns itself with interacting with contemporary audiences. Whenever we look at a logo, the, what the logo is wanting to do is meet us where we are and demonstrate to us the values that we understand here and now. 
uh, whenever we talk about art, we talk about it as a language. And, but whenever we talk about graphic design, we talk about shortened language or slang. In the same way that I could talk to one of you guys using genteel and academic language, I'd be much more approachable and likable if I am willing to adopt the slang that you all use. In the same way, graphic design is much more approachable. It represents to us something familiar and something that we can relate to. Whenever we look at a logo, we aren't just looking at a logo. The value of this icon isn't what it is in and of itself. A logo is nothing more than a few intentionally curved lines. But what the power of a logo comes not from what it is, but what it represents. So if it looks like an apple, it must be, right? But what if it wasn't? What if it was something more? Thank you.